podcast, we're going to share some ideas on developing a pre-snap routine for your offensive line. We're going to talk about pass protection and combos on inside zone and how in your career and with your players, the idea of pounding the rock can make a difference for you. And joining me to discuss all of that is the offensive line coach at Ohio University, Alan Rudolph. Coach, it's great to have you here today. Coach Keith, thank you for for having me. I can't wait to uh, spend some unbelievable time with you. And uh, man, this it, this is an unbelievable business that we're in, and getting to do things like this um, is is so exciting. And sharing is is I can't I can't wait. Well, Coach, I know we have a lot to dig into here today. Uh, and this was one of my longer pregame planning sessions for a podcast. Uh, I'm really excited about what we have to share. <laughs> Uh, but before we get into those, some of those things, I'm I'm always interested to learn about a coach and and you know what makes him tick, why he got into this profession, and some of those important lessons he learned early on. So we'll just start with something simple, and you know why did you get into coaching? What was it that made you want to be a coach? Well, my mom didn't want me to. Uh, my dad, my dad uh, was a uh, longtime high school football and baseball coach in the state of Mississippi. Um, and, uh, mostly most of his time as an assistant, he did have a few, uh, years here and there as a head coach, but, um, you know, he was a servant and, uh, to, to the players and to the coaches that he, he dealt with and worked with. And, um, I think that, uh, you know, my love for the game was developed through him. I, I can remember, uh, being on the football field when I was, uh, you know, I, four, four or five years old and um uh, we were at a, a little school in in south mississippi named van cleve high school and um there was there was four coaches on staff there alton waltman was the head coach neville Barr uh was an assistant jack shoemake was an assistant and steve rudolph my dad was assistant and um those men um loved me and took me in and and i can remember um you know coach waltman would make sure that i wore my whistle out to practice every day because when we ran sprints after practice when we did conditioning um i would stand at one end and and uh i would blow the whistle uh as a four and five year old young man uh for for the for the guys to to run wind sprints or whatever the conditioning was for that day um so my, no doubt my dad was a, a huge part of me wanting to become a coach. And then um, my mom, because, you know, the coach's life, I mean, there was a lot of nights that uh, she didn't know when to have supper prepared. And uh, she tried to get me uh, to go into to engineering. Um, uh, thank the good Lord. The good Lord had another plan. And uh um, early in my college career, I did start out in engineering, but early in my college career, I just knew that, that my love was football, uh, and, and I wanted to coach my love. My love was coaching, but most specifically football and, uh, knew that's what I was going to do. And, you know, that shaped me. And then, you know, I've been blessed to, uh, I played for some unbelievable coaches, uh, both in high school and in college. And then, have had the uh, great fortune of working with some unbelievable men um, throughout my career that that uh, have really developed and, and made me who I am as a coach, and I owe every bit of it to those guys. Uh, just listening to that brings me back to, to my days at Streetsboro High School uh, in Northeast Ohio. My dad was a high school coach, and, and I remember it the same way, right, you know, uh, him being an assistant there and all those guys he coached with and really feeling part of, of that family and being out there all the time. Uh, same thing with, you know, my mother, you know, would, would take me out to practice, which at the time, you know, there was no easy way to get there. So it was probably a 45 minute drive every day when I was young. And, and you know, just a thrill, you know, as a young kid learning the game that way and just seeing those things certainly is impactful. And coach looking at, uh, your your development there as you got into coaching, right? Some of those important yep. lessons you learned early on, you know, or, or mentors, uh, you know, those those types of things. What what were some of the biggest things that impacted you and really became part of who you are as a coach today? Um, 
you know, first, first thing, again, I'm going to go back to my dad. Um, he was, he, you know, and, and now, you know, if you talk football with him, um, you know, he still tries to keep up with the newest and, and latest, but you would say that the game probably may have passed him by a little bit with some of the techniques and schemes and this, that, and the other. But I learned so much about loyalty, not only to, uh, to, to the other coaches, but also loyalty to the kids and, and being great to young men. And that, that, that was the most important thing about the profession was, um, was helping young men and, uh, in a lot of cases, maybe being a father figure for them. Um, in a lot of cases, uh, helping them uh, reach goals that that uh, if it wasn't for this game or the coaches, that they would maybe never have a chance to reach. Um, so how to deal with players, uh, how to deal with, with the coaches that you work with. I think, uh, you know, my, my father um, – I learned more from him than I have anybody in the game as far as, as far as that goes. And then, you know, I played, uh, I played offensive line. I wasn't very good, but they let me take a team picture uh, at Nickel State uh, University in South Louisiana. And uh, uh, our, my line coach, uh, I was very fortunate. I had two in my time there. Um, one was a, a man by the name of Jerry Freeman um, who went on to coach at, at, uh, uh, McNeese State after there went to Mississippi State when the, when when Coach Cheryl was winning when Jackie Cheryl was winning games at Mississippi State for the most part he was the offensive line coach there and was a tremendous coach and um, I would have run through a wall for him um, and and we were running we were running option football but I still to this day. Uh, teach a drive block progression and most of that I got from him Um, you know and and we tweaked some of the drills that we do uh, but still it's the same premise that that he taught me uh, as a football player um, you know back back when I was playing so I give a lot of credit to him and I've learned a lot from him then um, after he left uh, uh, the guy that's the O-line coach at, at Colorado now, Mitch Rodri, uh, came in and was was uh, with me my senior year. I broke my leg um, halfway through the season, probably lost the last five games of the season. And, you know, I wasn't good enough or, or, or uh, uh, to, to move, even think about moving forward. So I knew that was the end of my career. And, and he was a great coach for me, and I ended up uh, working for him uh, for five years to start my coaching career. Uh, and, and he and I were the ones that, uh, kind of, I, I tagged along with him. And, and when we transitioned from option football to zone football and, and learning how to truly teach pass protection, how to teach inside zone, how to teach outside zone. Um, but he also helped me through a very tough time uh, because I love football so much, when I when I broke my leg, I knew I never was going to play again. Uh, I went through a very very tough time, and I want to give him a lot of credit because he was there for me uh, more than just somebody drawing up plays on a on a on a grease board. Of course, then it was chalk. Uh, there was no grease board then, but uh, um, he was there for me as as my coach more than just. Uh, teaching me a technique or, or putting me on the board. And then, you know, through my career, I've um, been very, very blessed to work with uh, some of the coaches I have. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast forward you, and I've already talked about uh, Tommy Condell, who was very, very important and instrumental in my development. Uh, but I'm going to fast forward to, to where I am now. You know, Coach Solich, Frank Solich is – has been unbelievable, um, and and the things that he has helped me develop, um, and the things I've seen from him, and the way he runs this football program, and then Tim Albin, who's the offensive coordinator here, um, it, it just just phenomenal, and things that I will carry with me for the rest of my career that I've learned from those two guys. So I've been very very blessed, Coach. When we look at what we do. As teachers of this game, you know what we put together as the themes or the imagery really starts to 
uh, taking on a lot of meaning for our players when we when we build around it. And I know for you, uh, it, it has multiple meanings, as we talked about, but uh, just a couple words really mean a lot to your players at Ohio University, and that's The Rock. What does The Rock mean to you guys? Well, first, uh, the first thing is I believe as an offensive line unit, and I know I know each position group um, probably feels this way, but I, I think the offensive line unit more than any other unit uh, on a football team um, is the foundation or should be the foundation of the football team. Um, I've been around some good football teams um, that uh, uh, that had really good offensive lines. I've been around um, some bad football teams that had good offensive lines, but for other reasons uh, didn't didn't have a good football team. But I've never been around a good football team that had a bad offensive line. So I think that that we are the rock and foundation. Uh, of the football team and we want to build that found we want to build our house or our football team on a foundation of rock not a foundation of sand Um, because uh, through trials through tribulations through wind through rain through sleet through snow um, that that house that's built on rock is going to stand strong Um, so that's one meaning and then uh, the other is 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 pounding the rock, and you know most people here when you say pound the rock, running the football, and I think that is an important uh, part of the game. If you look at what we've done here at Ohio, that you know that 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 we believe in running the football, but pounding the rock, I think, uh, takes on a different meaning. Um, sometimes when you work on things, uh, you don't see outward evidence of the work that you're putting in. Um, and to illustrate that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like hitting a rock with a hammer. Uh, you may not see the rock cracking on the outside, uh, but inside the core of that rock, every time you hit it, uh, it's starting to crack. It's starting to break. And sooner or later, if you hit it, uh, hit it enough and, and do it over and over and over again, that rock is going to crack wide open and, and then you can just take off. Uh, as a unit, as a team. Uh, so it also symbolizes, hey, we go to work every day. We practice every day. We need to eat right every day. We need to get our rest. How we work in the weight room is vitally important. And sometimes you don't always see the evidence, uh, whether that's in wins, losses, whether that's in being a starter, being a, a, a travel guy, I'm a scout team guy, you know, that scout team guy's down there and he doesn't see the evidence sometimes of his work, but he's just got to keep pounding that rock. Uh, and one day that rock's going to crack, crack wide open and, and he or us as a team are going to be able to achieve our goals and what we've been working for. Coaching, looking back at some of the things that were impactful in your career, I know that your time spent coaching Canadian football really helped you develop some things, especially as you thought about uh, you know, coaching outside of the box, right? In, in Canada, there's right. some different dynamics there that made you keenly aware of the game you know, out, outside of your five guys. Talk to us about, I guess, the thought process that you developed while you coached Canadian football and really how that's carried over to uh, your work now in 11-man football. There, there's a couple things. I, I think um, – I had gotten uh, stagnant, I think, is a, is a word maybe as a coach. Um, um, you know, bored, I wouldn't say would be the word, but, but, but stagnant in that, uh, you know, I had been coaching for, you know, seven, 16, 17 years before, before I went up to the Canadian Football League um, and, and uh, didn't realize it, um, but, you know, we had a certain way we were doing things and yeah, we would go look at different ways to get things done, but, uh, um, didn't realize it kind of just kind of, uh, everything had just become, Hey, here's how we do this. Here's how we do this. Here's how we do this. Anyway. Um, I, I take, a uh, the offensive line job with the Hamilton tiger cats, um, in 2013. And, um, 
got up there and, and really started watching some film my first week there and realized that the way that uh, the way that I had coached centers to ID things, uh, the way that I coached guards to see things, the way that I coached tackles uh, to be able to see and understand what was going on in the box uh, or the box area, the overhang area, um, you know, and, and and try to understand when blitzes were happening and that type of stuff. Um, because of all the dynamics of the motion of that game. Um, all of those, all of those things that I taught really got thrown out of the window and I had to figure out a a pre-snap process and we had a pre-snap process, but it was, it was very, uh, it was very, I guess, uh, simple. Um, this made me look and made me think, uh, outside of the box about, okay, how do I prepare my guys to get ready before the snap um, to be able to execute whatever we need to execute, but anticipate uh, what the defense is going to do um, and, and build processes and I fixes for those guys to go through um, in order to be able to do that. And then kind of a byproduct of that, I think, uh, uh, when when they have a process that they go through, um, and, and uh, that that is not probably anything that 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 a lot of coaches don't do, um, building a pre snap process for their guys. But it made me look at how extensive that needed to be, and I even started coaching peripheral vision and working working drills to increase guys' peripheral vision. Um, so that we could see longer into the snap and I could, I could be looking, my central focus could be in one place, but I was training my peripheral or, or non-central focus to be in other places. So there were some byproducts of that that, that carried over. And, and I don't want to get too deep there because that, that, that can get deep, but uh, it also carried over into um, – I think one of the things that really hurts seeing things is anxiety. Um, and, and when, when a player is anxious, um, you learn through studying peripheral vision, vision that the more anxious they get, the more uh, constricted their vision actually gets and they don't see peripherally uh, as nearly as well. So uh, that pre-snap process um, I learned to really t- make them and go through that. Um, and what I found is that it minimized anxiety of guys, whatever that anxiety was, whether it was the anxiety because of the, 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 the opposite, the defensive lineman that they were working against, or we were seeing a defense that did a bunch of different things. So uh, there was some anxiety there or, um, you know, we were playing on the road in a, in a loud environment. So naturally there was more anxiety there and the more anxiety there is the, the less vision that you have. So the less things that you actually see, uh, and the less you actually communicate to each other. So that pre-snap process, and I learned through studying it, you know, just like a golfer, uh, that is playing the first hole at the masters. Yes, that's pressure. Uh, But he goes through the same process each and every time that he putts or each and every time that he swings the golf club. And that process needs to be exactly the same on the first hole of the Masters as it is the 72nd hole of the Masters when he's playing to win millions and millions and millions of dollars. Uh, Because that pre-snap process or that pre-snap swing or that pre-snap ritual minimizes or lowers the level of anxiety. Um, it is it is that ritual that makes sure that he is zoned in on exactly what he's supposed to be zoned in on. And you talk about hitters all the time, and they're you know they see the ball and it looks like a basketball coming to them, even if it's a 95 mile an hour BB coming at them. Uh, they're just in the zone. Their eyes operate. There's no anxiety. They just feel like they're and I found that that really 
um, created a, a great level of play. Um, we play in and play out week in and week out, uh, first and 10 versus fourth and one. Um, and I think it's been something that's been very, very important uh, in, in, in training and developing uh, the guys uh, since then. You know, as you were talking about that, their, their vision was such an important part of that, and that kind of carries over to your teaching of the inside zone, which is a big scheme for you guys, uh, probably you know, your most important run scheme that you have. Uh, but – you know, it's it's hard to get those guys on defense to agree to just stay where they are at the snap. You have to have vision for the movement. Movement's always one of the most challenging things, you know, especially for young offensive linemen, right? But but even the veterans, if you haven't trained it well, if you don't train the eyes, it can be problematic. So how do you uh, continue, I guess, that idea of, of developing their vision so that you're able to uh, to train them to be great on inside zone, no matter what the defense throws at you, especially when they move? I think, Coach, first and foremost, um, one is understanding the value of training their eyes um, and how important that is, whether we're talking about the inside zone, whether we're talking about gap scheme. I mean, we can talk about gap scheme and our guard, uh, when we're double teaming a three technique on the front side of power or counter, he better be looking for run through and he better be looking for cross face, uh, nose cross face on the center. And his eyes better be there. Um, that doesn't minimize the violence at which we're double teaming that three technique, but I'm going to do it with my eyes where they're supposed to be. So, uh, and I, you know, I think about us where our eyes are supposed to be on the slide side of a protection. Um, and I, and I am the, the guard, the center or the guard that is setting a gap that does not have an immediate threat in the gap. So I'm a guard and there is no B gap defender or I'm the center and there's no A gap defender. That process that, that my eyes must go through to make sure that I'm looking at exactly the right thing um, so that if we get a back, a back fit blitz or a back flow blitz or uh, we get somebody crossing face, um, we see that as we're supposed to see it. Um, and then training that on a daily basis. And just as we train pad level, just as we train uh, the steps, uh, just as we train the landmark, just as we train exactly where your hands are supposed to fit, uh, we train exactly where their eyes are supposed to be at all times because. We do run full zone, meaning non-combo zone, inside zone. Uh, we do run a full zone scheme. We also have certain looks that we get into three-way uh, calls because of a certain look. So we're in a three-way zone combo rather than a two-way two zone combo. But when we can, Coach, we want to put 600 pounds on 300 pounds. Um, you know, we want we want a guard and a, a guard and a center double teaming uh, an inside technique guy, and we want the backside guard and backside tackle double teaming an inside technique guy. So we want to put 600 pounds on 300 pounds as much as we possibly can, but as much movement as we see, um, it, it, you know, in our game, and I think we see a lot of movement just because. Uh, we do run inside zone. Guys know that uh, we're gonna we're gonna run the inside zone. Probably seventy percent of our run game is gonna be inside zone based. Um, we see a lot of defensive schemes to try to use movement to try to stop the inside zone. Um, so it would be real easy to say, well, let's just full zone everything, uh, and that handles movement. But when they don't, we wanna we wanna fit up a true double team. And we want to get vertical distortion in the in in the defense. Um, and in order to do that, uh, we've got to utilize our eyes properly to turn combo zone into full zone when we need to post snap based on the movement of the defense. So I think um, that starts when freshmen get here day one when we start 
uh, drill work, immediately I am on them about where their eyes are supposed to be. And when we teach techniques, I teach them not only where their eyes are on a landmark, but where their eyes are supposed to be, um, even if they're not uh, blocking a specific defender, even if we are in a combo and they're not looking at that guy. That's different than if I am drive blocking a guy. And then once I, the movement does happen on a drive block, where do my eyes need to go after post-snap movement? So just training all those things and drilling them just like we do every other base fundamental um, that, that we typically train as, as, as any position, but as an offensive line coach especially. Coach, for a long time, I was a quarterback's coach, and you know, prior to that, coached running backs. I coached offensive line, and um, eventually <clears throat> finished up coaching offensive line again. Uh, but something you said there, I think, is is really a, an important point to emphasize to our listeners, and it's something, as I said, I, I really learned in coaching the quarterbacks, is that we run through <clears throat> a lot of individual drills, and don't put all the components of, of what need to be a part of it, it almost gets a, a tunnel vision f- uh, focus on that particular drill on um, one thing. And in this case, as you were saying it, it's the eyes. So, you know, relating this to the quarterback position, other than what we would call our ignition drills right at the beginning, which are kind of warming up the arm. Anytime we get it, got mm-hmm. into throwing a ball, their eyes were involved in it too. So as an example, they might just be continuing through their, their warm up and doing their drops where, uh, they might be throwing on rhythm or they might be taking a hit step up through, but we'd always emphasize in those that, you know, maybe it was by day, maybe we let a quarterback change up the call, or whatever it might be, that if they were hitching up to something, they were envisioning mm-hmm. seeing one thing and then moving their eyes to that next target rather than dropping back, looking at that target the whole time, hitching up and throwing to that right. target because it never, ever happens that way in the game. Their eyes are coming to it from a certain direction. So we, we started really emphasizing that in every drill, those eyes had to be a part of it. And I think it's the exact same thing for the offensive line. We might be working on, you know, uh, you know, the, the single part of, of the footwork of, of an inside zone play. And, you know, I think Mm -hmm. the mistake that's made is that you just let that guy go ahead and focus everything, his eyes on that one target. When in reality, on inside zone, it's rarely going to be that way where he's just looking at that that one thing, you know, where he's got that tunnel vision and focus there that um, you have to build Very that into so. all your drills. And then one of the things we do, Coach, that, that I'm sure everybody does, uh, so I'm sure we're not. But, you know, in, in fall camp and in spring training, uh, most of the time you don't, have, you don't have any logos or any stripes on your helmet. Um, and one of the things that we do um, is is we put stripes on the offensive line's helmets so that on film I can visibly see which. Now, you know, I don't know that they're actually looking at what they're supposed to be looking at, but I can at least tell on film that their eyes are in the direction that they're supposed to be in. Um, and I agree with with your point, you know, drill work wise, we may be working drive block in a shoot, uh, but we're always going to add uh, what happens if the defender moves on that drive block and then where do my eyes go? Um, you would think we're crazy, but we may be working. Uh, we may be working a scooch technique in the shoot, but I'm going to have maybe our grad assistant over on the other side of the chute and he's holding up two fingers or he's holding up three fingers or he's holding up one finger so that everybody has to be able to tell me immediately when I ask him how many fingers was he holding up, they better be able to tell me too. Um, I can see that their head is turning that way, but I want to create a focus for their eyes so that they are training to look at what they're supposed to be looking at in the direction uh, that they're supposed to be looking. And coach, I want to go back to one thing when we were talking about pre-snap process with your eyes. You may pick up something as a coach on film. Hey, uh, you know, there's a three technique and, they, and their backer, uh, does, you know, most of the time 
um, when, when there's a three technique, that backer is going to be in an A gap alignment or, or 20 alignment, however you define that. But all of a sudden, if he's lined up in a 30 alignment or a 40 alignment, that's weird. That's odd. That may not necessarily mean that you're seeing a, 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 a the three technique dump in the gap or you're seeing a pirate stunt where the three and the five are dumping out, dumping the gap. But it, it's odd that he's there because they don't traditionally play him there. And so you may have something that you say, well, 80% of the time, if that biker's alignment is there, you can expect that this is going to happen. But if you don't teach them to go through that process on each and every play, you're not going to be able to go into that game week and say, okay, guys, when that Mike backer is aligned in this alignment, expect. It's not 100%, but you can expect the possibility of this happening. Well, if you haven't trained that from day one, that's not going to just show up on Friday or Saturday night or Sunday just because in your in your initial uh, uh, scout team, I mean your initial scout uh, scouting report that you said, hey, when that backer aligns in a 30 alignment or a 40 alignment to a three technique, that it's 80 uh, percent that the three technique is going to dump in the a gap right there. It's not going to happen. They're not going to be able to carry that over into the anxious moment of a football game, um, and especially when it's third and five. And you need to be able to anticipate that because now I'm on the man side of a protection and I'm the left guard. I, my set may be just a little hair different because I saw that backers alignment. So building those processes, building those eye pro, uh, from day one of teaching, I think will allow them to be carried over on game day as well. Coach, in, in expanding on your run game, I know one concept that, you're able to get a lot more out of is the way that you teach and use the same as principle. And so for you guys being an inside zone team, there is a lot of carryover to how you teach your gap schemes. And I know, you know, coming up through this game, you'd hear things like, well, you could be a zone team or you can be a gap team, but there is a way to be both when you find those same as, because you might take uh, your, your deuce block, on a, a, a double on a, on a three uh, and mm-hmm. it's easily to translate that to, you know, that, that backside B block, right. That, that you're getting mm-hmm. on inside zone or whatever yeah. you guys might call it. But I think what, what, yes. what I'm saying here is you can teach both of these. If you find the way to be able to efficiently drill those techniques and apply them to the two distinctly different schemes. I, I agree 100%. We, um, and, and, and we've, we've talked about it already. Uh, we're married to the inside zone and that, you know, that's not going to change. And, um, I, you know, because of that, I think that's why we've had success, uh, with it along that we, we have really good, we have really good players too, which always helps, uh, helps a lot of things. I'm a lot better coach when I've got really good players doing it, but, uh, we are married to the inside zone. And, and so, therefore, our practice is going to be married to being good at that and being able to handle uh, as many things as we can handle um, blocking it uh, or, or putting our quarterback's eyes on what we can't block or, or whatever we're choosing to do game plan-wise. Um, but being able to handle a ton of things with the inside zone um, that eats up most of our, our practice time. So in order to be good at other things, um, you know, you, you've got to do some same as stuff. The great thing about it is um, to me, and, and I know there's a lot of guys uh, running duo and we're not a, we're not a heavy duo team, um, but we do have a tight track on the inside zone that is different than our normal inside zone track. So I guess you would say more of a dive track. Um, and, and, in, and also when our, when our tight end is run, when we're running split zone and our tight end is, a, is coming across the formation, we're going to get different reactions out of linebackers, uh, whether we're running a dive track or whether we're running a split zone 
uh, where we're bringing our tight end across the formation at the snap. Uh, so we use different combinations and different fits of those combinations uh, based on those things. And I just call them minus combos, whether it's based off the alignment of the backer or the play that we're running. Well, what I found is that those minus combos, I was able to marry very closely to uh, gap scheme combos. And, and now all of a sudden, uh, the B on the backside of inside zone um, was, was becoming very similar to the, the, the deuce on the front side of gap scheme, whether that be power or whether that be counter. Um, so when we were drilling those things in practice to be good at the inside zone, we were also drilling the same thing um, on power. We may just be working to a, a, a different backer uh, where that B is, we're, we're being to the backside backer. Now we're deucing to the far backer rather than the near backer. Um, but the fit of the combo is the same because the reaction that I'm going to get out of that far backer when we pull the guard or we pull the guard tackle, um, you know, it, it's going to be all of a sudden he's going to be right on top of that double team uh, because they're chasing the pullers. So anyway, we were able to now, if you had all the time in the world and all the practice time in the world, you know, you could you could argue that maybe there's a maybe there's a better way to. Uh, to 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 do the deuce block versus the B block, uh, but I think it has fit very well for us, knowing that our A play is going to be inside zone, and then our B play is going to be gap scheme, um, or maybe even our B play is going to be some some form of option, and then our C play may be gap scheme. However, however you look at that. Um, we're not going to have the time to put on all the individual work uh, to that gap scheme combo. Um, so we have to do it same as we do something else that we're married to. Um, and I think that's been uh, very important. And when you're working that, you're also getting another rep at what you are married to. Coach, in, in continuing with offensive line play, um, you, you've emphasized the importance of the inside zone and, you know, Ohio, you has been known for running the football, but you still have to protect the passer at your level. Even if you're going to run the rock effectively, there's going to be those times you have to protect. And, and I know you guys uh, put an emphasis on that and do some unique things there as well. Talk to us about how you train up your guys in pass protection. Um, first thing that, that I think, uh, uh, number one, I believe in building the pass set from the ground up. Um, I also, um, so that there, there's, there's some things there that we teach, um, but, but in the movement portion of pass pro, I believe that it's very important that the pass set begins with the ankle leading the movement, um, so that I can maintain maintain square hips and uh, squareness to the line of scrimmage as long as I possibly can, um, because I, I also one of the one of the other things that I learned in Canada that we didn't talk about that just kind of came out as we're talking, you know, the defensive line in Canada is a yard off the ball, um, so um, if you teach a pass set the same way up there that you teach down here, you had tackles oversetting uh, defensive ends because the defensive ends are yard off the ball. So if you teach the spot the same way up there that you teach the spot here, you're opening what I call a window of vision to the quarterback. And if you give a defensive lineman a window of vision to the quarterback, most of the time he's going to take it. Um, and then that becomes the most direct line to the quarterback. So in pass protection, you know, uh, this seems oversimplification, but we want to keep our body in the window, in that window, in that line of vision to the quarterback um, and, and keep that window closed, basically, so the defensive lineman can't see 
which tells him he's only got one way to go to get to the quarterback. That other way he's thinking about going is not there for him. Um, so uh, closing that window, I think, comes in two ways. Number one, it, co- it comes in staying square and, uh, um, I mean, excuse me, setting a spot and not oversetting that spot. And the second way that it comes, it comes in staying square. Uh, and, Coach, if you can kind of think with me, if I, if I set a defender – and I am in that window, and um, I am square, okay, Uh, that defender will not see any type of vision to the quarterback. But I can be in that same exact spot, and if I open my hips and I open my shoulders, now all of a sudden he sees a lane or a line of vision underneath me to the quarterback. Um, If you can kind of envision that mentally, in your mind. So we want to stay square and in that window until the defensive line gets to what we call the point of no return. And the point of no return, and I believe pass protection is a battle of the hip. The defensive lineman wants to get, if he is just not running through your soul um, in a bull rush type situation, he wants to win on your hip or on the edge, whether that be your outside hip or your inside hip. So we want to stay square until he gets even with my hip. Because if I start to open before he gets even with my hip, then he can he can rush back underneath me. And by me opening, I am actually opening that window for him to see the quarterback. And then I think, you know, so we've talked about uh, the set, staying square, okay? One of the big things that I think offensive linemen do that creates them to get open, not only is what they do with their lower body, but then also um, we teach uh, independent hands. So I'm going to use my outside hand, um, as long as that defender is trying to rush my outside hip, I'm going to use that outside hand and not get the inside hand involved in the pass protection until the point in time he turns at me and then it becomes a bull rush situation or until the point in time he gets to that no point, that point of no return uh, that we were just talking about. Because if I try to get my inside hand or we call it our point hand because it's 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 on the inside or our post foot so it's the post foot and the point hand if I try to get my point hand to the punch and that defender is rushing my hip uh, and he hasn't gotten to the point of no return by me trying to get my inside hand to contact on him I'm going to open my hips too early and again opening that window so kind of three phases, uh, the ankle lead, um, the spot in which we set, okay, and then thirdly, the, um, uh, the inside hand, uh, and, and we use independent hands, and then we read uh, the pass rushers, either shoulder, we call it a shoulder read or a chest read, and, and those reads tell us what to do with our hands in pass protection. Um, we're not always going to shoot our hands. Um, we're going to shoot our hands when we got low numbers coming at us. But if we don't have low numbers coming at us, me shooting my hands is not what I need to be doing. He really wants me to shoot my hands. That way he can use my hands. The last time I checked, the defensive line coaches have that machine that dummy down there that that's that's a stand-up dummy and they have the two arms sticking straight out for the defensive linemen to work all their pretty pass rush moves on well I don't want to stick those hands out and become that pass rush dummy for them so we use those reads that we get uh, based off the pass rush of the defender to determine what punch sequence or, or punch fundamentals that we use uh, in pass protection. Yeah, that's such an important part of pass protection. And, and I don't think the independent hands are talked about enough. I see only a few resources out there when you, when you look at 
all the teaching of it. You hear a lot of guys talk about the different scheme, but I just don't see that emphasized a lot. And I think it's such an important part of it. And yes, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to train, but ultimately, you know, it's about setting your players up for success. So it is important to think about how you can train uh, independent hands for you. What, how do you, how do you approach, you know, getting that going, especially because I'm sure you see, you know, a lot of the guys who you work with you know, probably in, in high school weren't exposed to that as much because they weren't in a, maybe a pass heavy offense or, you know, they just weren't trained that way. We, 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 um, I, I guess it starts in two places. Number one, we never punch anything with simultaneous hands. Now, you're going to watch our film and you're going to say, Rudolph, yeah, right, whatever. Because there are times when we get a low chest read, when we get a bull rush read, you're going to look and you're going to say um, that your hands are making contact at the same time. And 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 I would I would agree with what you're saying, but the way it's taught is my inside hand is my point hand, and my outside hand we I teach that as, as we call it a pet hand. Um, and just very simply, if you're rushing right at me uh, with low numbers, so I'm reading that as a bull rush or a power rush uh, uh, demeanor from the defensive lineman. Um, we're going to start and we're going to do what we call point peck. But I teach it that way because I've already started emphasizing that our hands, although they are going to work uh, in a point peck situation, it's going to be pop pow. It's going to be pop pop. Our, my hands are going to almost be at the same time. I'm already emphasizing that they work independently, that they work separately, that I'm not shooting both hands at the same time. The point hand is going to go first, and then the peck hand is going to happen. And we start drilling it that way. And I do a base, um, a base pass set punch progression based off of the pass set reads that, that we have that we go through on a daily basis. And a lot of days, it's no more than a 50 or 60% drill. Um, that, that, and you can get everybody working at the same time which I love because you got, uh, you know, I, I've got 20 linemen where they're paired off right side and left side and centers make up the centers make up the difference because they've got to work both directions. Uh, but all of our right side linemen are being rushed by a left side lineman, um, you know, and I'm giving them the read and then we're working setting and using that independent hand fundamental um, in, in a, in a 50% or 60% manner. Uh, so we begin there. We begin tying in teaching the individual punch techniques with the reads from the defensive lineman. Because I think like we talked about with pre-snap process, if you don't force them to go through that, you'll never get enough reps at it where they feel comfortable using the different techniques, um, in order to use them during during a competitive situation. Also, I think the off season is vitally important uh, for them to do that do it often, especially in off season drill work. Uh, again, doing enough that they feel confident in throwing those techniques that you're teaching. They feel confident in their 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 read training with their eyes to know what one, what fundamental to use with what read that they have. And then when they see some success because of it, uh, I think that just breeds confidence, which allows them to have the freedom to use those things. And, and I think freedom is the key word. If, if a young man is not free, um, he's not going to do it. And I think it's my job uh, just to train that over and over and over again. Now, if you said, hey, coach, um, you know, we're going to be a run, heavy play action, and we're only going to drop back five or six times a game, then you may look at is, is, is that kind of a cost effective, uh, so to speak, fundamental to use. You know, I, I think there's conversation to be had that maybe you don't. Uh, but, but, you know, when you do drop back 
uh, and you're going to have to be successful on third and long, uh, dropping back and throwing the football. I think you're giving kids tools uh, to 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 uh, be successful, but most importantly, I think you're giving them answers uh, for for problems that you know are going to arise. And if you don't have those answers, then I think uh, I think in your meeting room. Uh, those guys kind of look at you cross-eyed like, what the heck are we doing, you know? So um, that's kind of how we begin it and how we drill it, and then we use the off-season extensively because we are a heavy run football team. We are a heavy play-action football team, but I can use 10 minutes in a meeting room somewhere to drill these things. I don't have to be out on the practice field uh, to drill them. So, um, you know, that's how we kind of go about it. Coach, flipping switch a little bit and, and just looking through uh, your career, you know, you've talked about a lot here and, and things that you've learned along the way. Uh, for you, what are some of the things you've learned that you could pass on about really how to be successful in this profession? And, you know, I, I think it applies certainly to the young coaches out there, but uh, the, the veterans can learn from it as well. Uh, what tips do you have for our coaches out there? Uh, the first thing I would say is always be loyal. Um, always be loyal to, um, to 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 the guys that you're working for. Um, as long as as um, pick, and I would say also try to pick wisely who you're working for. Um, that that the grass is not always greener on the other side. Um, early in my career, you know, I probably was chasing the job and I was chasing the this and I was chasing the that. And, and the longer I go, the more I value uh, being with a Frank Solich, being with a Tim Alvin, being with the guys that are on this staff, um, because um, they are well grounded in who they are and what they believe. Um, so you're not going to be asked to do things. And it's very easy to be very loyal. Uh, to them uh, because of that. You know, the second thing I would say is be married, uh, be married to something. Um, know who you are and stand, stand for that um, morally. And then also be married to something uh, football wise. Um, don't always chase uh, that play, that, that new, new, fine, shiny, uh, pretty play. And all of a sudden you look up and you're running 52 run schemes uh, because, man, that, that, one, that one's pretty. Uh, so let me put that one in. And then you look up and you're not really good at anything. Uh, find something that, that fits your kids, that fits the players that you have, um, and, and, and then really devote some time and energy into becoming really good at that. You know, we're – we're heavy inside zone, but I would say that we're probably really sophisticated in the inside zone. Um, we're not sophisticated in running a bunch of different plays, uh, but within the inside zone, we probably do quite a bit of things that maybe some other people wouldn't do because they're not, they're not married to it. Um, so just find some things that, that uh, uh, you, you want to be good at and, and work toward those. Um, and then, you know, I would always say uh, one of the biggest things for me, um, you know, and, and I grew up, I grew up, uh, um, like I said, with co uh, working with my dad and I, I learned to line a football field. I learned to cut grass. I learned to get up and, and uh, at, at two o'clock in the morning with my dad and go move the sprinklers. Uh, because we had to run the sprinklers all night because we were trying to get the best uh, best looking field for the guys that that he coached, and uh, you know the, the, those things are things that that I've learned, and and guys don't have to do those nearly as much. One because one because you got great you got uh, uh, artificial surface field, so you don't you don't have to take care of the grass the same way. You don't have to line the lines the same way, but, but you do have to wash laundry or you do, uh, you de do need to understand how, how the, how the equipment room works and, and, and maybe learn how to put together a helmet. Now I couldn't put together a helmet anymore, but I guarantee you I've screwed 
I've screwed uh, I've screwed the chin strap pieces into the helmet before, and I've put the padding in a helmet before, and I understand how how the old ear pads that used to snap in. I understand how they work, um, you know, and and all those things I think keep you grounded, um, and, and and also make you understand that you're never too big, you, you you're not too big for your britches, you know. Um, so I I would say find ways to work, find ways to you know I was taught as a young guy, hey, make sure to compliment the, the guy that the lady at the cafeteria line that's serving your food and having to clean up your tray and the, and the, the man that's the, that's the janitor that's having to clean things up. Uh, I would say not only be great to those people, but, but find ways to do things and, and so that you understand uh, how they work and that keeps you grounded. Coach, you've shared a ton of great stuff with us here today. Um, but looking at all you do as a coach, if I said, Coach, you know, boil it down to the most important thing, what's the one thing you do as a coach that really gives your players the winning edge? I'm going to say uh, culture, and I know that culture word gets thrown around all the time. Um, but, I, but I think on, the, on the, the, the teams that have been truly successful that I've been a part of, the championship teams that I've – that I've been a part of the the offenses, the O line rooms, what, whatever you're whatever you're measuring that off of, uh, the 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 units that have been really good, um, the culture in that room was unbelievably strong. Um, so I would always say that the development of of the player as a young man, and then the development of the room as a team or as a unit um, is always the most important thing. Um, and, and, and more, and we get caught up as coaches. I am very guilty of it. I, I love the X's and O's. I love the fundamentals. I love the technique part of the game. Uh, but I think far more important than those things is uh, the, the room that you put together and every year you have to re-put that room uh, together. I think you and I talked about that earlier. Um, You've got to re-put that room together each and every year and no year is going to be the same. Uh, So I think you've got to think, and I know that sounds really elementary and really simple, but you've got to think uh, and it can't be cookie cutter every year. Uh, because there's different personalities. There's different, one year you're going to have an older room. The next year that room may flip and it may be a younger room. Um, you may have a room that, that um, you know, it, is driven uh, by your, you may have one bell cow. You may have three or four guys that are leaders in that room. There's always different dynamics uh, within that room. And I think you got to really think, about putting that room together uh, because I think that is the most important thing about being successful in this game. Coach, for our listeners out there, what areas of the country do you recruit? I recruit, uh, I have the, the, the Mississippi junior colleges and uh, kind of West Tennessee, the Memphis area. Um, and then Arkansas and Louisiana are kind of um, just because of the connections um, are my areas uh, as well. Um, but, you know, we've gotten to where, um, you know, we recruit so position specific, which I kind of love because I get to, I get to uh, go visit coaches in all parts of, of the country Um you know, because just going and looking at old linemen, um, plus you get to really know the guys that you're recruiting. So I do have an area, but then we are very position specific recruiting. So, you know, some of that recruiting area that, that you and I used to know uh, back in the day, which you stayed in that area, you really didn't venture too far out of that area. Now you may go do your home visits and stuff, with the guys that you had narrowed down once you got to that point. 
but you really hammered that recruiting area hard. I think now that has become a little bit, bit, bit different because I'm not always getting into those schools every day. So you've got to cultivate those relationships with those coaches in different ways than going by to see them, to, you know, once, twice, three times a year, whether they have a player there or not. Um, but I, I guess I got off on a tangent a little bit there, but that's, that's my areas. Uh, but then we recruit position specific. So I guess my area is all over. Yeah. What's the best way for our listeners to connect with you, coach? Uh, I would say number one, just, uh, at, at, at my Twitter page, um, at the rock OL play, um, would be the easiest. And I would absolutely love that's, um, you know, since I've kind of started that Twitter page, uh, and it's not really that old, um, and, and you know, it it is mostly coach driven. Um, I have loved the conversations with with O line coaches, with offensive coordinators, with defensive coaches all over the country. Um, you know, that's the beauty about what we're doing. Um, you know, I know I know COVID and and has put a lot of pressure and and uh you know made things you know not not so pleasant in a lot of ways for a lot of people uh but one of the one of the beauties uh, of what we've had to learn to do is 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 now um you know i can be on a on a clinic talk with a guy in washington uh out in washington state in in a minute where that never was necessarily the case or open and, and available to so um, reach out to me, DM me, uh, and I love talking ball, as you can tell. Um, so would love to uh, would love to cu- cultivate those relationships, and and that's kind of an intimate way to do it, which I think is pretty neat and pretty cool. Well, Coach, I really appreciate you taking the time. Before we go, I do want to mention uh, you've put together all your resources on Coach Tube, uh, an outstanding job. I know you have an offensive uh, line. Um, Pass protection series. You have the inside zone series. Just, uh, I believe, yesterday or this week, you put up a, a few courses on the reach. Um, I'm telling you guys, this is worth checking out if you are an offensive line coach. You want to get better at running the football in inside zone. Uh, check out Coach's resources. I'll put a link in our show notes so you can get to those. So, Coach, uh, thank you again for taking the time today and talking ball and uh, for putting your resources out there for coaches as well. Keith, I appreciate it, and I appreciate what you guys are doing for the game, um, not only from the clinic standpoint, but also uh, Coach Tube. And I, I just think it's a, a unbelievable resource, and and all of the hard work that you guys are putting in uh, to help coaches grow and develop. I just think it's an unbelievable thing, and I appreciate you allowing me to come on your podcast, and have absolutely enjoyed it, and would love to do it anytime. Absolutely. Well, we'll definitely have you back and take you up on that, Coach. So good luck to you and the Bobcats in 2021. Thank you. Thank you again for listening to the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. Please, if you are enjoying the podcast, head over to iTunes or Spotify and click five star for rate. If you have a minute, write a review. It really helps the podcast. Check out our new home for the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. That's at coachandcoordinator.com. And follow me on Twitter at Coach. Kay Grabowski.